Welcome. Today we're going to discuss the use of computational chemistry in the drug discovery process. Um, before I start, I think it's worth getting some key words out onto the screen so that you, when I mention things like leads and optimization, you understand where about in the process that we're talking. So this is an idealized version of a drug discovery process where we start with a gene, hopefully with a genetic association to some kind of disease. Uh, gene encodes for a protein, and we will typically look to screen molecules against that protein to find what we would call lead molecules. So these are molecules which may bind to the protein, but they're not good enough yet uh, to put into in vivo systems, for example, in animal safety studies or indeed go into human beings. Uh, that's the task of lead optimization, which is to improve the molecules to the state in which we feel we can no longer improve it and it's as good as we can get uh, to, to take into animals and then hopefully into the clinic with humans and to test against that disease and test the, the gen genetic to disease hypothesis that we started with. And computational chemistry can be used along this process uh, and here is a a summary of all of the types of activities that a computational chemist might get involved in during their uh, project support or during their career. Uh, starting at the left, there is some overlap with the bioinformatics community, particularly when we're mapping uh, sequence to protein structure. Protein structure is very important to computational chemistry, as we'll, uh, we'll show you later. Uh, however, the bulk of our work is performed from lead discovery through to candidate selection. Uh, and here we're looking at the modeling of uh, molecules, be those large collections of diverse molecules for screening collections, uh, smaller sets of uh, molecules which have been into uh, in vivo systems, so we might want to build statistical models based on that data set, uh, <clears throat> all the way through to uh, lead optimization work where we are trying to understand molecules in congeneric series and looking at the small changes we might make in order to affect certain properties like solubility or binding or function. Computational chemistry as a discipline has been around for many years. Uh, you can trace it back to really the 1970s. Uh, however, it's mostly been uh, restricted to uh, the discovery side of the drug, drug discovery process. Uh, until recently, uh, and in recent years, uh, computational chemists have become uh, involved in many other uh, aspects of uh, discovery and development, be it attrition analyses or risk assessments, uh, or indeed these days uh, branching out into solid state and multi-scale modeling, looking at how, uh, for example, uh, the structure of a, a crystal structure might affect the properties of, of powder in manufacturing. Here's a, a depressing statistic for everybody. Uh, it's a little bit out of date, but uh, it hasn't changed too much. Uh, and here's one of the reasons why you see uh, such a lot of turbulence in the pharmaceutical industry itself, uh, in that our attrition rate after we uh, select a candidate to go forward uh, through into the clinic, our attrition rate is extremely high in the 94% you know, here. Uh, it hasn't changed uh, over the last decade. Uh, very few industries manage to survive with that kind of failure rate in their product development process. Uh, and it's acutely important for us to understand ways in which we can identify safe and efficacious molecules so that we don't suffer such alarming attrition rates in the future. The good news is there are only really two questions in drug discovery, and that's you know, which protein or pathway are we going to target and which molecule are we going to make? Uh, we're only going to talk about one topic today, and that's which molecule to make, a molecule design. And if I gave this talk maybe 20 years ago, I would really be focusing on small molecules, uh, because that was where computational chemists tend to work. Uh, these days, uh, we work on all kinds of different types of molecules, be it traditional small molecules, peptides, uh, protein therapeutics, such as antibodies, uh, Bioconjugates, where you might join a large molecule to a small molecule. Uh, I mentioned materials, and we're also involved in things like uh, evolving enzymes for our manufacturing colleagues, so that we can manufacture our, our products in a more green fashion. Um, but I, I'm still going to 
focus the talk today on the small molecules because that's where the bulk of the work still is uh, and that's where the majority of our examples are. And I'm going to talk a lot about lead optimization. Um, this is where we've got a lead molecule um, and we go through a, a classic design, make, test, analyze cycle that many industries are familiar with. Uh, drug uh, industry is, is slightly more complex in, in the test phase uh, in that we have these things called screening cascades. So for example, you, you, you might have some nice, fast, cheap assays, uh, for example, for binding or selectivity or function. Um, and they give you essential information rather quickly. Uh, but the more complex and more valuable information is around uh, pharmacokinetics or uh, disease models, and those are typically still in animal models. Uh, and clearly we can't get a lot of data from those, we can't put a lot of molecules uh, through animals, and so we're very selective on the types of molecules we put in there. But that necessarily restricts the size of that data set. Uh, and we need all of this information in order to understand the structure activity relationships or SAR in our molecule series and we need all of that information in order to decide when we've got a suitable candidate molecule. So surely computation can can help with this uh, and some people will be familiar with the, the term rational drug design which uh, attracted many people of my generation into computational chemistry in the first instance uh, and in that context rational drug design was where we would get a protein structure and we would design the molecule to the active site of the, of the protein structure. Uh, most design methodologies are aimed at obviously of, of doing this as quickly as possible, ideally in one shot. Uh, and it's fair to say that all design methodologies have to date had very limited success in this regard. There are a small number of uh, very elegant stories on, on rational structure based design, but they are in the minority of drug approvals. So why is that? Well, one of the big problems is that uh, lead optimization is a, a multi-objective optimization. So we may start with a lead which binds to the protein of interest. However, in order for that lead to turn into a drug, it has to satisfy many other things. It has to be safe. Uh, it has to be bought, particularly in a, a favorite oral dosing uh, environment where it's, it's got to come out of your stomach, it's got to get absorbed into the bloodstream, uh, it's then got to get to the point of drug action, and it's got to stay there long enough, so it's got to have metabolic stability. Uh, and in order for all of this to happen, generally soluble molecules are required. Uh, and so the molecule has to satisfy all of those criteria, uh, and doing so has tradi traditionally not been particularly easy. Uh, we often liken this to the fairground game of whack-a-mole, where you fix one problem and it induce another one just pops up and you have to whack that one straight after. Uh, and you know, computational methods uh, do offer the tantalizing uh, prospect of being able to do this in a more rational and direct way, if only we could predict accurately enough how to get there. So in this respect, where, where can computational chemistry help? Uh, I'm going to talk about two, two aspects where we clearly feel that we can and do impact, uh, and then we'll go on to some uh, harder, harder problems where we're having some impact, but we're working on having more. So let's start with structure-based drug discovery, which is what traditionally people associate with computational chemistry. And here's an example published by the GSK Stevenage group, which is the structure-based optimization of some ATAD2 bromodomain inhibitors. Bromodomains are proteins that recognize acetyl lysines uh, expressed on histones, and they're epigenetics targets. Uh, and the ATAD2 bromodomain has been associated uh, with various cancer indications. If you knock ATAD2 out, then the survival of certain tumor cell types uh, goes uh, down dramatically. Um, because bromodomains recognize acetyl lysines, they all have a certain recognition element to them. Uh, and this has been exploited by groups, uh, putting together focus sets of small fragments that might mimic the acetyl lysine head group. Um, 
but one of the problems that this approach induces is of course that all of these uh, Bromo domains have the same recognition element and therefore selectivity can be somewhat of a problem. Uh, here's a good example where uh, a small molecule has been found that binds to ATAD2 um, but it has very little selectivity over uh, the so-called BET Bromo domains BRD4 to BRD1. And the challenge here is what can we what can we do to get that selectivity by using the protein structure. Uh, one aspect of Bromo domains is uh, what people talk about as the shelf, which is uh, a region of the protein not, not too distant from the acetyl-lysine binding area. Uh, and it's indicated here as the RVF shelf. So computational chemistry was used to look at the position and the linkage uh, from the uh, inhibitor structure to see if uh, we could branch out and position groups onto the RVF shelf which might increase the binding uh, and you can see the results here. Uh, an ether linkage was identified through the modeling as, as the ideal vector and orientation to deliver that cyclohexyl group uh, and indeed you, you do gain an order of magnitude in binding through doing that. However the selectivity uh, remains a problem. And here we can exploit uh, some bioinformatics approaches. You can look at the uh, equivalent residues uh, in that position of the protein structure in the Broma domains. Uh, and what the group noticed was that these two arginines uh, in ATAD were not present in the BET Broma domains. Uh, however, the rest of the uh, shelf region is quite lipophilic. So you're looking for something that can make an interaction with these uh, positively charged arginines but it's still not, not charged itself because that might give problems binding to quite a lipophilic pocket. And so this cyclic sulfone group was identified as a potential uh, and indeed when, uh, when the group made, made these molecules uh, you can see that we gain potency but more importantly uh, the selectivity begins to appear for ATAD2 which is very satisfying. Finally, the uh, optimized fragment from the previous work was added back to this molecule and now you can see that there's uh, two or three orders of magnitude of selectivity uh, over the, the BET family that has been achieved through some quite elegant optimization work. So I mentioned uh, that this work started with some directed fragment libraries. So this example is building fragment libraries for use in kinases and here we're exploiting the fact that kinases bind ATP and they tend to use the same recognition motif, the same type of pocket to do that, uh, namely the backbone residues uh, highlighted here with the arrows. Uh, from many protein ligand structures we know that kinases exploit between one and three of those hydrogen bonds to bind different types of uh, ligand uh, and so we can look to put fragments into this library with a certain number of criteria, for example, uh, one to three hydrogen bonding groups probably should have an aromatic ring um, and that will filter down their initial fragments groups and then we can do a little bit more work. So we can look at, for example, which compounds we've already got. Uh, we don't want compounds that might react when we screen them. We can then apply these uh, hydrogen bonding and aromaticity definitions. Uh, we can then be a bit more specific about the binding orientation of those hydrogen bonding sites and introduce the 3D information that we know from protein crystal structures. That will then get us a list which will probably be too many and certainly in this case was too many for us to screen routinely. So we use chemical clustering to bring together very similar molecules together from which we'll choose only a small subset. Uh, and then we'll put them through a quality con control procedure um, to look, make sure the, the molecules are rather pure because fragment screening you're going to screen them at quite high concentration. Uh, <clears throat> and this process started off with uh, many thousands of potential molecules, ended up with just under a thousand fragments that we now re screen routinely against kinases. And after having screened them against a number of kinases, some, some very interesting things emerged. Uh, even though these fragments were selected because they should bind to a common recognition element in all the kinases, what we find is 
uh, they actually have some selectivity profiles and each fragment has its its own selectivity profile which was very interesting result and a little bit unexpected so what can you do with this well one of the common uh, metrics that you'll hear computational chemists talk about is a Tanimoto coefficient um, this actually originated with uh, botany would you believe uh, was quite happily stolen by uh, chemifomatic scientists uh, when they started looking at how you measure similarity between molecules <clears throat> and it functions off of a, a fingerprint so it's very useful for bit strings and, and computers uh, and you can turn this selectivity profile into a fingerprint by for example in this case any any uh, kinase that had a percent inhibition of greater than 30 percent has a one set uh, and any kinase that has less than 30 percent inhibition has a zero set so you can see that we've got those two selectivity profiles in red and blue on the bottom left uh, and they give rise to subtly different uh, fingerprints uh, and then you can compare those fingerprints using the Tanimoto coefficient uh, and you get a value between zero and one one where those fingerprints are identical uh, and zero when they're completely different and we can do that with computational chemistry uh, descriptors as well and then you compare something that's calculated using computational chemistry versus something that's calculated from the real screening results and you can see does the methodology actually uh, compare can does chemistry and biology meet uh, and we used a, a technique using 3d similarity here this was the uh, what's called the Cresset free field screen technology which I'll explain a little bit more of later uh, but this does similarity in terms of the uh, ele electrostatic field that is projected from a molecule uh, and for each molecule pair you can again get these uh, Tanimoto coefficients based on on uh, your similarity um, top right compares the fragment field similarity calculated using the 3d metrics against the activity profile similarity that we observed uh, and you can see that in general the computational similarity as that goes higher then the real activity profile gets more similar which is very reassuring uh, but what it means is we can use these sort of techniques to add to that screening set uh, because now air cheminformatics similarity maps to air biological similarity so we're not going to add redundant molecules into the set which will probably give us the same results uh, what we should be able to do is to uh, add, add to the set molecules that are genuinely different uh, but will also bind to kinases with a different type of profile and that's what you'll be looking for as you in, you know build your set and go forward okay so we talked about using protein structures uh, and people will naturally turn to things like docking and so on however before we uh, go further there are some things that everyone needs to be aware of when when working with protein structures uh, what you see on a screen isn't real um, what uh, a crystal structure is is uh, is a static representation uh, of a molecule uh, and actually what you observe when people put these balls and sticks on a screen uh, these have been fitted to the electron density that's been observed in the experiment and those have been fitted by the crystallographer okay so you've actually produced a model on top of the electron density which is itself is a static representation uh, and in real life proteins move particularly in solution uh, hydrogens that you see are again often assigned and not observed uh, water molecules that you see in a crystal structure are often assigned and not observed um, when you do your calculations uh, you have to think how is solvation being treated especially when you're looking to make hydrogen bonds between a ligand and a protein because in order for the ligand to bind to the protein it's got to come out of water uh, and the protein's got to be desolvated too uh, so are you really going to uh, make a, a strong interaction when those uh, hydrogen bonds were quite happily saturated by the solvent in the first place am I taking entropy into account entropy is very very difficult to calculate computationally 
uh, but very, very floppy molecules uh, don't like being frozen into uh, a binding site uh, and, and only allowing one of their conformations to be expressed. Uh, and importantly, how are you calculating your energies? Uh, some of you may remember your, your physical chemistry uh, lectures or may be trying to forget them. Um, but the diagram on the right shows you a very simple picture of when two atoms come together uh, and on the x-axis is the distance r between them uh, and when the atoms are apart uh, it's a very small potential energy slightly attractive as the molecules get nearer and nearer uh, that energy reaches a minimum at the equilibrium distance often known as the, the van der Waals radius uh, but if you try and push the atoms too close together then all of a sudden the repulsive energy as the two uh, nuclei start to engage, uh, it rises uh, proportional to r to the twelfth, so a very, very sharp increase in, in energy. Okay. So what could be a small bump when you're trying to dock your molecule could in reality turn into a very, very high energy interaction. And finally, ligand conformational energies are as important as protein-ligand interaction energies. It's very easy to be sucked into looking at the protein ligand interaction energies and forget about what's happening to the ligand there. Uh, and so ligand based modeling methods are very effective when you also have a protein structure. And I've got a very clean example of that now. So this example is factor 10A and, and thrombin inhibitors. Uh, these are serine proteases. Uh, and in this series of molecules, uh, there are two very similar uh, analogs with very different uh, KIs against thrombin. So one reason for those different binding energies might be they have a different binding mode. But here's a picture of the ligand uh, that's taken out of the uh, protein ligand complexes and you can see that the binding mode is pretty much identical. When we come to analyze this with computational chemistry you can find the reason uh, for the difference in binding energies by doing what's known as a conformational analysis. So uh, you can see that I've highlighted the sulfur to carbon bond in red there with an arrow around it. If you rotate the molecule around that bond and every 10 degrees you calculate the energy, you can produce these diagrams on the left. Uh, and for <coughs> the molecule noted M1, what you can see is that the difference between the binding conformation, which is shown in the orange dot, uh, and the lowest energy conformation is about three kilocalories per mole. Whereas for the molecule M2, which is has a higher affinity, you can see that the observed binding mode is almost uh, identical to the lowest energy conformation. So M1 has to uh, exist in a much higher energy conformation than it would like to, and this reduces the binding energy and hence the binding affinity of that molecule. Okay, we're going to move on to virtual screening now. Uh, so this is the in silico equivalent of uh, wet assays or high throughput screening. Uh, however, it does require a method for us to predict where molecules are going to be active. So you might have a protein structure, as we've been discussing. Uh, you might have uh, a couple of other things, and we're going to talk about 3D pharmacophores in a minute. Uh, one of the other options is, is a statistical model a so-called quantitative structure activity or QSAR equation, but we're not going to cover that today. The great thing about virtual screening is that it's capable of screening many more molecules than could ever be made or tested in reality. And particularly the days of cloud computing, uh, you can see people that have done very large experiments, you can test billions of molecules in these experiments. Uh, however, this high throughput use of computational chemistry actually requires us to make a lot of approximations about the types of calculations we can afford to do. You can use a bewildering variety of chemical descriptors to do things like virtual screening, and here are just a few of them. We've talked about the ones in the bottom right, which are these sort of fingerprint type approaches. Uh, you can calculate those from just the molecular graph or structure. You can calculate things from the shape of the molecule in 3D and again convert those to shape fingerprints. We talked about molecular fields. We're going to cover these odd little things called reduced graphs. 
Um, uh, and now we're going to move on and, and, and go a bit more in depth around 3D pharmacophores, which are amongst the most popular approaches for people using for virtual screening. I'm going to ask which ones are best? Which descriptor should I use? Uh, it's a very difficult question to answer because there's probably no right answer. Uh, however, the standard things that, that we use in our group, uh, we use 2D fingerprints and reduced graphs for molecular diversity. Uh, we'll use a lot of 3D pharmacophores, fields and shape for, for knowledge-based work. Uh, but what I would point out is that you know, a lot of the software these days uh, has very good science behind it. Uh, and the most important ingredient, I would say, is the, is the quality of the person using the tools, not really the, the software. Um, it's all about understanding the approximations we're making uh, and your review of the results. Are you getting what you expect to be seeing? Are you getting things that are a little bit odd? Can you investigate why that is? Can you refine the hypothesis you're testing? And so on. So all that good scientific method. So pharmacophores. Uh, there's an IUPAC definition of a pharmacophore. I think it's one of the first uh, IUPAC definitions that, that really speaks to computational approaches actually. Um, and it, it's really a minimalistic uh, expression of what you need uh, for a small molecule to bind to a large molecule. And, and here are three different ways that, that you can describe pharmacophores. Uh, the one on the left is dis describing molecular features, so hydrogen bond donors and acceptors and a positive charge nitrogen, and you know distances between them. Uh, and you can see that when you're not using any 3D information, you, you're really having to work hard to, to give a matrix uh, of distances where only a certain 3D uh, arrangement can, can satisfy them. Um, you can be very, very simplistic, and I'll show you this, this acid to uh, aromatic ring centroid example in a minute uh, or you can be a little bit more sophisticated like the one on the right uh, and this is a 3D arrangement uh, with directionality for hydrogen bonds and, and so on uh, and that sort of representation is probably the most common these days. Okay this is one of the very first uh, successful examples of the use of 3D pharmacophores in, in virtual screening that was, that was published back in the mid-90s. Uh, it's a really nice example because although the pharmacophore is very, very simplistic, uh, it's an acid group separated from uh, an aromatic ring by between 9 and 11 angstroms. Uh, what it illustrates is how useful pharmacophores could be because the two molecules uh, that it was derived from, one is a cyclic peptide and one is a natural product and a quite complex natural product, neither of which uh, a chemist would be particularly keen to work on synthetically. Uh, the cyclic peptide is unlikely to have the properties that, that we need for a drug. Uh, the natural product may have other, other problems. You can see it's uh, phenolic and it has Michael acceptors in there and, and so on. Uh, but by distilling the essential pharmacophoric features out of there and searching the database of small molecules, the group at Rampelonk were able to find some very nice small molecules which were very synthetically tractable. So you're able to use uh, very difficult information to get exactly where you wanted to get to. More sophisticated way of describing molecules from that simplistic uh, description is the molecular field methodology and it's typified by uh, the approach by Cresset or other, there are other people that, that use similar uh, ideas. Uh, and this is really describing the molecule by how the protein might see it. So you're looking at the fields that the molecule emits. One of the advantages of this type of technology is that you can really represent uh, the reality of molecular recognition. Uh, on the left hand side is, is how a molecule might be viewed if you were using a, a typical simulation package, so molecular mechanics where you typically have a, a charge centered on each atom uh, and if you calculate the electrostatic field using just atom centered charges you end up with uh, uh, the, the blue bulb opposite the carbonyl, which is directly along the, the carbonyl bond. And the same thing for the NH hydrogen bond. But if you look in the Cambridge crystallographic database about uh, how 
hydrogen's hydrogen bond to a carbon ion or how hydrogen bond acceptors hydrogen bond to uh, an amide NH, what you'll see is that actually they don't bond uh, straight on. In this case of the carbon ion, uh, the minima are, are at 120 degrees which actually corresponds to the direction of the lone pairs from the carbonyl oxygen. Um, and the Cressic technology uh, is quite smart. What it does, it puts these sort of extended atom types and puts multipoles instead of monopoles at the atom positions and therefore it's able to represent the type of molecular field that is then uh, used uh, to hydrogen bond to by those groups and, and therefore you see that in the experimental crystal structure databases. And here's an example again from, from our group about using that type of information and that type of approach to do some virtual screening. So again you'll see a very complex molecule uh, in the, uh, the top left along with some small molecule structures all of which are oxytocin receptor antagonists. Uh, and when you distill out the essential pharmacophore from that What's very surprising, given the size of the top left molecule, is that you can actually do the same job with a very, very small molecule. Uh, and looking at them, one would never think intuitively that those two molecules could appear similar to a protein, but they do. Okay, we've talked a lot about 3D approaches, um, but you can use these similar concepts without uh, go into the computational expense of, of popping everything into 3D. Um, so 2D pharmacophores sort of encode pairs of these pharmacophore points just separated by a certain number of bonds and again you can produce these fingerprints uh, to compute molecular similarity and so on. The advantage of, of doing this is that you don't have to worry about active confirmations so using 3D you can be very very specific about the arrangement of these uh, pharmacophoric elements but if you're wrong you're wrong and there's no getting away from that uh, if you're using 2D then you won't be wrong because you haven't tried to encode it the disadvantage of using the 2D is of course that you may be less selective than the 3D methods you may need to screen more molecules so where maybe you might need to screen a couple of hundred molecules with the 3D method uh, using the 2D method you may need to screen a couple of thousand and that's all going to depend on your screening capacity or if you're trying to buy the molecules, how much money you've got to spend and so on. The 2D pharmacophore method of choice at GSK is this thing called a reduced graph. Uh, and here's an example. Uh, so starting with the structure on the left, uh, you can mark this up in terms of its pharmacophoric elements. So at the bottom you have two aromatic rings. In the middle, uh, it's an aromatic ring with an acceptor. Uh, we then have that amide linker group, which is encoded as a donor acceptor. Uh, and then the top right ring is denoted as an aliphatic ring with an acceptor atom. Uh, and you can think of this now as, as some kind of little graph of those things, where each of these nodes is colored by the type of pharmacophore element that, that it exists. Um, and we then borrowed some techniques from bioinformatics. Uh, we used uh, the same type of edit distance similarity techniques that are used when people are trying to do sequence alignment and similarity. Uh, because you can, uh, for example, you can chop the, uh, the left-hand blue node off uh, and look for molecules that are still quite similar. They're just missing one element. You can change a color of one of the nodes, for example, uh, and still be quite similar. Uh, and you can do this in a very quick and easy way. And here's an example of, of if you use that molecule that we've just uh, gone through, if you use that as a query against uh, some databases uh, of other CB1 antagonists, you can pull out molecules which, some of which to the eye look very similar, but actually with their standard 2D fingerprints and Tanimoto's uh, aren't computed as very similar. Whereas a reduced graph, some of them are even bringing back identity, i.e. They're, they're identical, even though the chemical structures are subtly different. Uh, and then the uh, AstraZeneca molecule on the right, you know, clearly is you know, fairly different 
um, and uh, the reduced graph pulls out that very easily indeed. So these are quite powerful techniques for just quick lead hopping uh, and using information you have to, to find different series. And you can even use them to mine high throughput screening data. They're very effective at pulling together uh, groups of molecules that, again, like this one, uh, the, the 2D graphs are quite different and so uh, fingerprint methods would, would often not bring them together in a cluster. The reduced graphs fish them out quite naturally. Okay, we're going to talk a bit about um, physical properties and solvation. So here's a article that was published by two of my colleagues uh, and what's always surprising with computational chemistry is that simple metrics can often be as effective and competitive as very very complex calculations so uh, if I was in academia and you asked me uh, we need to study some solubility uh, data and, and build some models I might run high-level quantum mechanics I might be looking at a very sophisticated calculations uh, as it turns out if you have a large amount of data and you look at the trends um, you can come up with very simple metrics which are good enough certainly for industrial use uh, and one such metrics is this uh, solubility forecast index uh, it's based on a, a famous uh, equation called the Yarkovsky equation which relates uh, solubility to the lipophilicity uh, of a molecule and its melting point uh, and my colleagues what they did because melting points are actually relatively hard to get because you have to make the molecule and uh, you have to crystallize it until it's pure and that the melting point is relatively constant uh, and these days we don't tend to do that kind of thing uh, but if you substitute simply the number of aromatic rings uh, as a, an approximate for melting point uh, and the reason for doing that is that actually if you look at lattices and how melting points uh, go up and down you'll find that highly aromatic molecules tend to have quite strong lattice energies because they tend to the aromatic rings tend to stack uh, in the crystal structure um, so SFI the solubility forecast index is, is simply the, the log D plus the number of aromatic rings and when you can compare that to real-life solubility data you can see that uh, if for example this SFI is five or less you tend to be on the whole very soluble if on the other hand you get above eight or nine then you will almost certainly be very insoluble um, and this is a great guide that, that you can use to guide your chemistry and drive yourself to solubility space if you like okay so we've talked about sort of potency binding solubility uh, what about the things that we're not particularly good at uh, these are obviously very important things. I mentioned the safety attrition that, that we have in, uh, in our candidates. So can we predict toxicology? Can we predict off-target effects of molecules? Uh, can we predict permeation or active transport of a molecule? Can we understand where it might accumulate, which organ it might, or tissue it might accumulate in? Uh, and can we predict the metabolites of a molecule? Can we predict how quickly they'll form? And can we predict how quickly a molecule might be excreted I think the answer to all of those is uh, we can't at the moment uh, but it's something that we're trying to do because it's it's so important and one of the limitations on some of this is that again the data sets and the throughput of the relevant assays are rather small so we're not in the luxury that we have with some of our uh, binding uh, affinity calculations where we have large data sets to learn from well I mentioned the SFI um, here's a follow-up paper what well, we took that uh, that metric and we applied it to a, a variety of other things uh, and it's astonishing how well this metric holds up and applies to to many aspects of, of drug discovery so we talked about solubility so the other things that you will be looking for in a, in a drug candidate uh, you'd rather it didn't uh, be highly bound to uh, your serum uh, so you don't want it, what we call plasma protein binding, don't want that very high. Uh, you can see that, uh, again, once you're below about five on your, on your SFI, if we've re renamed it PFI now, uh, because it's rather more generic than we thought, then you don't tend to have uh, a, a large 
a probability of being highly protein bound. Uh, the same of interacting with cytochrome P450s, so these are metabolizing enzymes that can quickly metabolize your molecule and uh, get rid of it very quickly. If you keep your PFI down, you're less likely to be a substrate or to be an inhibitor of those enzymes. Uh, you're less, like, less likely uh, to have clearance issues. Uh, you're less likely to bind to uh, the Herg ion channel. So the Herg ion channel uh, is one of those that is a real no-no because molecules of uh, drugs have been pulled from the market because they bind to the Herg ion channel and that leads to arrhythmias in the heart. Uh, and patients have died through those kinds of uh, side effects. Uh, but if you keep your PFI down, you're unlikely to bind to that ion channel. Uh, and we also looked at promiscuity, i.e., are you likely to bind lots of different unrelated proteins? Uh, and again, low PFI means low promiscuity. However, the reason that drug discovery is so hard is that, of course, not everything lines up in the way that you would really like it. Uh, and if you look at the... Uh, the bottom line, the, the permeability data, what you'll see is permeability has a trend in reverse to all of those. So low PFI is not good for permeability. Now, if you clearly want to get across membranes uh, or if you've got an intracellular target and you need your small molecule to get into a cell, then you need it to be permeable. permeable. And so you can see if you line up permeability with all of these other criteria, you have a very, very narrow window of PFI where all of those uh, are likely to be able to be met. Uh, and that's one of the real challenges of finding those molecules in that sweet spot. I'd like to highlight this paper from, from Mike Waring, which summarizes uh, a lot of the large literature around lipophilicity, metrics like PFI, and all of the issues uh, that we have uh, in drug discovery about finding quality molecules. It's a very good paper. So the other thing we can do, we don't need to predict everything, we can do data mining. Uh, and we can look to the past to solve our current problems. Uh, so here's a, a classic example if you're in a program team uh, and you're, you've got an issue. Say you've got high intrinsic clearance with your molecule uh, and you think it's something wrong, you've got a phenyl ring at the bottom right corner and you want to change it to improve your clearance. Uh, and your chemist in the room that uh, may have been in the company 30 years said, well, in 1983, we changed that for an oxidiazole and it worked for us in, in, in program X. Why don't we do that? Um, and that was really the sort of inspiration for the tool that we use called Biodig. This is actually a, a technique that's now quite common in, uh, in many companies and, and there are many papers on this called match molecular pairs. And this really builds on how chemists tend to look at their data. Uh, and one of the most powerful things is to look for very small changes to a molecule to see what's happened. Uh, so the, in the, the left-hand example, you're changing a furan ring for a phenyl ring. In the right-hand example, you're literally just moving the sulfonamide substituent from para to meta. Uh, very small change, very single change. Uh, but if you can see and build up all of the data. So every time we've moved a sulfonamide from a para position to a meta position, what has that done for, I don't know, solubility or HERG or whatever? You can learn some rules and you can learn some probabilities about if I've got this problem now, what should I try to change where it's got the best chance of success? Uh, and in large pharmaceutical companies, we actually have very large databases of this type of uh, SAR analysis to build and to learn from. So here are just some numbers from, from GSK. Uh, for example, you know, solubility again, 267,000 molecules measured with the same solubility experimental protocol that we've used. So the data is directly comparable. That leads to 243 million of those single small changes to learn from. Uh, very large data sets, very powerful. So this is the sort of thing you can do, is to look at your molecule and say, uh, I want to change that. What, have, what types of changes have been made for that substructure, which improve clearance? And you can go and you can pull back all of the data. You can look at all the changes that have been found, and you can come up with a change, for example, like this one, uh, which 
has a, a good chance of improving your clearance. There's no prediction involved, it's pure data. Okay. What else have we learned over the years? Uh, this is a, a SWOT analysis, analysis, so strengths, weaknesses, threats, and opportunities. Uh, and uh, with uh, Andrew Leach and, and Marty Head, uh, we, we'd lay their groups through this, looking at the state of computational chemistry and where we were, and some of the things that we, we were pleased about and some of the things that, that, that were challenging. Um, and a couple of things that I would like to, to highlight here. Um, slow progress in our fundamental science and, and, and performance plateau of our techniques. So here's a great example. So uh, with the advent of, of amazingly powerful supercomputers and cloud, we see very large simulations. We are able to apply quantum mechanics and free energy perturbation and, and many other very, very powerful techniques. But here's the sort of reality of problems that you, you come across. So this is the result of a fragment screen against a protein. We found this relatively small molecule that binds quite well to the protein, quite good affinity. And then you get the crystal structure. Uh, and what you find is that this molecule binds to the protein through five water molecules and hardly makes a single contact atom to atom. Now, having seen this result, I'm sure I could find a technique that will predict this. But if I didn't know the result, I would be very unlikely to be able to predict exactly what's going to happen here. Okay, it's one of the delights of working uh, in drug discovery. It's one of the challenges. Uh, but our, our techniques are still not good enough to predict this kind of thing uh, in a way that we can action them. Here's another lovely example. So this is docking. So this is uh, taking a, a set of unknown molecules, uh, docking them to a protein, and then you know one of these blind challenges, uh, can your docking procedure actually reproduce what was seen experimentally? Uh, and you can see that actually there are some methods that get very, very close to the actual answers, so that's very encouraging. Uh, until you go and see what methods they are, and that my colleague Eric Manis and Marty Head, and those are manual docking by very, very experienced computational chemists. They're not docking algorithms per se at all. Um, but nonetheless, so there's something about the sort of 10,000 hours thing and an expertise in computational chemists that can still outperform the best algorithms that we have. Okay. The other problem that, that we see is uh, poor alignment of academic, academia and industry, uh, unfortunately. Uh, here's a good example. So uh, there's a lot of publications on virtual screening and different techniques and so on. Uh, and there's a lovely paper published by the Bayerath group here, uh, which is uh, pulled together all of those examples into a database so that you know, people can refer to them and keep them and, and uh, use them as a, a data set and so on. Um, but when we looked at the compounds in this data set, there's 537 compounds. Only 71 of those pass our standard compound collection filters, i.e. compounds that we'd be happy to screen against our proteins. Uh, and it really you know, comes to this, this thing I've put in the head in. What are you looking for? You know, are you looking for a probe molecule, a tool molecule? Are you looking for a drug? We're just looking for a publication uh, because you can find hits from virtual screening very easily, but if they're promiscuous or they just interfere with the assay or anything like that, then they're not really useful, not moving the, the, the methods forward or the field forward. Uh, there's an excellent blog by a chap called Derek Lowe uh, he's a chemist at Vertex, uh, and every time he reads a virtual screening paper where they uh, publish certain chemotypes, which are well-known promiscuous chemotypes, he uh, puts another entry in uh, and has another moan. But it's a, it's a great blog because uh, he comes up with some nuggets. If people want to learn about how uh, industrial chemists think, then, then Derek's blog is an absolute goldmine of information. The other thing we did, we, we went and interviewed our our groups and said if if we were going to take one bit of software away from you what would you moan about most and we all thought it would be I don't know you know protein structure docking or you know pharmacore searching or, or something actually visualization came out the strongest thing and and uh, 
to us, I think this is uh, symptomatic of a relatively immature field in that we don't trust our calculations enough to just use them. What we need to do is we use them, we then visualize the results, uh, we study them, we try and understand what we're seeing. Uh, and I've highlighted in bold, you know, very rarely do we use any of their methods without any intervention or and guidance. Uh, and so that's what I would encourage anyone who's working in this field or starting off in this field to do. Always visualize your results because unfortunately, you know, our, our, our techniques are not fail safe. Uh, and they do need to be supervised. And there's a lovely paper by Anthony Nichols, who's the CEO of uh, one of the software companies, OpenEye, uh, which really uh, talks about this in, in a more quantitative manner, uh, really highlighting the difference of, of where we are in computational chemistry versus fields like you know, engineering. So will computation improve? I think we are making very good impact on, on fields such as structure-based discovery uh, and things like solvation. I think those will improve. I think the, the power of computers and the simulation and quantum mechanics that we're now able to, to bring to bear is going to improve us. Uh, the same kind of uh, computational power will help us look at things like crystal form prediction and so on and will aid solubility. I think we can do some things on these harder issues. Uh, it's going to take some time. Uh, these are very difficult topics, and we will be able to make some headway, um, but it's not going to not going to be happening, you know, next year or the year after. So, in summary, computational chemistry I think is a, a key component of modern drug discovery, uh, but with the caveat that you really do need the experience of know-how of individual scientists to get the best out of it. Uh, we are beginning to find application for a wide variety of problems and not just in, in small molecule discovery. So it's a very exciting time, I think, for, for computational scientists. Uh, but we have a long way to go before we can replicate what is done in other industries. Um, but it's clearly a journey we must begin now.